My name is Michael Case. I'm with Kira Consulting. We're going to talk about fusion today. Um, not the type of fusion that Larissa thought I was talking about. We're not going to talk about fusion like energy and stuff. We're going to talk about a different type. Um, and let's start with some motivation. Um, if you um, if you're in the modern um, C++ techniques session that I gave last year, some of this will look familiar. We're going to calculate the distance between two points, but this time we're going to be a little smarter. We're going to actually use a tuple to do it. And um, so we have two, two, two tuples, if this is A and B, um, and they're defined as a tuple of two ints. And we have another that has three ints. And the idea is that we want to create some algorithm that can calculate between the distance between these two points um, irregardless of the dimensions. So let's go ahead and step through this. We want to just be able to call distance have it all work. <clears throat> all right, we, we've seen this common form before of calculating distance. Works out to be that we're going to take the, um, the like axes, the difference, square them, sum them up, and take the square root at the end. So let's look at a distance algorithm. We have our distance. It takes in two points, P1 and P2. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to look and see what? Tuple size. Yeah, but they're the same size, right? Because if they're not the same dimension, we're not, we're not going to pretend like we know what to do at all. And we just want to static assert and get out. If they are the same size, let's go ahead and do something. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct this Pythagoras giving it the types, point 0.1 and point 0.2, the total size, and then we're going to call apply, passing in um, the two points. Does this look like a common pattern that people have seen or not? Oh, boy. Okay. Um, if we get to the, thanks, right. <laughs> um, let's continue on. We'll see how this works out. We're going to get some accumulated result. And at the end of that accumulated result, we're going to take the square root of it and return that. And we'll have our distance. Um, and for our, our time being right now, we're going to call this generic enough. All right? Um, so what would Pythagoras might look like? Well, it might look like this, where it is a strut in which um, it has three template parameters. The, the first two are the types that we saw. The third one is this int that has the dimension. Um, and the apply. The apply is a static. We're going to pass in two points. And we're going to get, based upon the dimension we passed in, the dimension minus one, we're going to get that value out of the tuple. right? So get zero would get me what? the first element in the tuple, right? We're going to do that for both of the, each of the tuples. We're going to take the difference, assign that to d. Then we're going to take and say d times d, because we need d squared. And we're going to instantiate another Pythagoras, giving it, instead of d this time, d minus 1. How many people were in, um, in the tuple talk just a little while ago? OK. so. My, my guess, I, I missed it, but my guess is there's probably some recursion going on in there in order to walk over tuples. Yeah? All right. So that's all we're doing, right? We're just recursing and walking over the tuple. And eventually, we have to, um, to terminate, or else um, the compiler will terminate for us. And so we terminate, return 0. Everything folds <laughs> back out. And voila, we've got, we've got the answer we wanted, right? OK, so this works. It's OK. We can, um, we can have a my point, which has an x and a y in it. And, and if I want, I can go ahead and um, construct a point and a my point, and then forward as tuple these two values. So now they get forwarded as a reference, as a tuple. Sorry, the elements are as a reference, as a tuple into it. And then, and then it works again, right? So I, I have a tuple. I'm passing two tuples in. This will work. All right, now I have the secret point. 
And secret point has a git x and a set x and a git y and a set y, or it can have anything that you want. But now I have a problem because my generic distance isn't going to necessarily work. It doesn't know how to extract x and y, in this case, to calculate. Well, I mean, what do I put here? I'm kind of lost. I'm not sure what to put here. Any ideas? Okay, so I could, I could put a function there, and the function can take the type and then return, um, in this case, my tuple for me. I could do that. Um, let's just stop here for a moment. Go ahead. Don't spoil anything yet. Let's, um, let's just call this a failure at the moment and move on. All right, so um, here's our distance. And that thing, to me, looks a lot like maybe a fold or an accumulator, right? And the Q and the P are the elements from the series or the dimensions of each of the points. And so this looks like a convolution or a zip. I, want, I have these. And I want to calculate based upon these sets, right? Cool. Because standard template library comes with all kinds of really neat algorithms and fancy things for us to do stuff with. So let's go see what we can do with a tuple. Uh, we can make them. We can assign them. We can swap them. And we can tie and forward and get things out of them. And we can compare them. And we can get the size and maybe the, um, the element type. OK, we're kind of lost, right? This is, this is not really great. H how many of you, this is like the age test, remember the days before STL? All right. How many of you remember the days before you knew about the standard template library containers and algorithms? How many of you? Don't use standard template libraries and algorithms now. OK, good. You just have to ask. So life was really horrible back then, wasn't it? You kept writing your own algorithms. You kept making your own containers. You kept trying to figure out ways to iterate over things. It, it was horrible. And so somebody standardized this for us. And we don't have to do it anymore. Well. Where are iterators, ranges, algorithms? Where are our fancy things that we can do stuff with? Um, tuples. Because at least from my point of view, the tuple interface is lacking. There's a, there's a lot to be desired. So we lucked out. We have fusion. So fusion provides iterators, ranges, algorithms. It also provides a variety of different containers, lightweight views, functional features, sequence adaption, extension mechanisms. Think of Fusion as the STL for tuples. It gives you the stuff that you want to be able to take compile time and run time use them together and be able to work with tuples again, which is what that says. So let's, let's redo this. And let's use Fusion this time. Our points look identical. The slide is the same slide. Nothing's changed. All right, let's calculate our distance again. So our distance algorithm is going to change a little bit. I'm going to use this result of size value. This is the fusion way to figure out what the size is. I'm going to create this zip type, which is just a vector. This is a fusion vector. We'll get to what that means in a moment. But it's a vector of a reference to the two point types that come in. 
And here I'm going to ask for a zipped view of the two sequences <coughs> that got passed in. So I have two tuples that got passed in. Please give me a view of the two that are zipped now. So if I was to iterate over that view, I have the zip as opposed to two tuples. And I want to fold. So take that sequence, fold on it with an initial value of 0. And what do I want to call each time? Well, of course, Pythagoras. So our Pythagoras is going to change slightly. It's a little easier now. It's just an operator. Yes? OK, so zip is going to take these two sequences. And instead, we're going to end up, sorry, thank you. We have the waving flag in the back. The question was, what does zip do? The so zip is going to take the two sequences. And um, in, out of it, we're going to get a sequence of these two values. And we want that sequence of two values because that's how we want to operate and process on the values, right? We want to process each, each um, ordinal of the axis at a time. So I want all my x's at once. I want all my y's. Then I want all my z's. That's how I want to process the, the values. So here I have then um, it's a fold. So what is, what is the last value coming in? So the accumulated. And then the axis. This is the, this is the zipped value. So I'm getting both, um, all my x values at once, all my y values at once. And then I'm grabbing the 0, the 1, doing the same difference as before, accumulating the, um, the, the multiplier of the 2, the square of the 2, um, and returning that. So, so this is easier to understand, simpler, less code. There was none of that funky compile time recursion as far as I can see, right? I'm just using it. Um, it can also handle my point. But look what I can do now with my point. I just take the tuple that I've constructed. I construct a my point, And I pass them both into distance. That's kind of a neat trick. So somehow, my point looks like this tuple. It's better. Secret point. I can just create a secret point, And I can just pass it into the distance. And somehow now, it also looks like a tuple, or a heterogeneous collection of somehow. How does it do that? My point has been adapted to look like a fusion sequence. Very simple to do. We simply say, adapt the struct. Which struct? My point. What are the types in it that I care about? What do I want to adapt? Because I can adapt it in any order. I can adapt any of the parts that I want. Well, I want in this order x and y and their doubles. Secret point was a little more complicated. Everything that was of interest is in private. So now I need to use accessors in order to get things out. How do I do that? Boost fusion adapt. ADT, what do I want to adapt? And then what is the get and the set in order to get and set these? And we'll talk more about adapters later. But this is all that was required, and it's non-intrusive, to make this thing look like a fusion sequence. So this would be pretty easy now to expand and create more algorithms that worked on tuple type components or on um, other structs. How many of you have used Spirit? So Spirit has um, attributes, right? Attributes work because of fusion. You adapt your struct so it looks like a sequence. And therefore, you can uh, fusion can fill it in and do things with it. Or Karma can use it to create and generate things. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, is the, uh, this is going to be the quick overview of Fusion. Can you imagine somebody sitting here and talking about STL in 
um, an hour and a half. Um, and going over all the containers and you know what the, the different types of performance parameters are in the containers, the algorithms and stuff. So it's not as large as STL, it's pretty large. We're not gonna do it in an hour and a half, but what we're gonna do is hopefully encourage you to think that Fusion's very cool and it solves a lot of problems, even world problems that you didn't even know about. So let's a sequence. So we're gonna talk about some concepts. Concepts are what we use in order to describe things, right? So a forward iterator is a concept. It has things, it has asso um, associated type defs, it has um, methods maybe associated with it, it has characteristics that tell us what a forward iterator is. When we see that concept, a forward iterator, we can then talk about things that model a forward iterator. And everything we can do with the forward iterator, we can do with this thing that models it. So we're gonna talk about the concepts that exist, um, for a few of them for Fusion. Um, a forward sequence. What can we do with a forward sequence? Well, that's an interesting question because with Fusion, it depends upon what you're talking about. So the, the hardest part about starting with Fusion, at least I found, was remembering that half of the time you're dealing with compile time issues, metaprogramming that's going to run as the compiler's running, and the other half of the time you're dealing with runtime issues. You're actually coding for runtime. So we have two columns. We have a runtime and a compile time. So for forward sequence, we can do begin or end. Any guess of what begin and end do? Yes. What is, pardon me? Um, this is going to be the type that the runtime will generate. The question was, is what is the middle column? Thank you. Yeah. One more. So a begin and an end, just like in your standard template library, begin and end, will give you the begin or the one pass the end iterator, right? What kind of iterator? Well, with a forward sequence, you get a forward iterator concept back out. This is a fusion forward iterator concept. <coughs> size, for the runtime size, you're going to get some integer that represents the size of the, of the container you're dealing with or the sequence, I should say. Yes, but as it is, it doesn't fit on my slide. The question was a big, long question that I should have on the slide from the lady who actually knows everything about concepts. She would know. You're right, actually. No, that's true. Um, So empty will tell us whether or not it's empty. For a, for a fusion sequence, for a tuple, when you asked it if it was empty, does it know whether it was empty at runtime or at compile time? Yeah, compile time, right? These are compile time things. However, we have, we have a runtime ability to ask, is it empty? How about size? Do we know size at runtime or at compile time? What's that? Both? Yeah, both because we have runtime and compile time. Um, front is going to return the type, or excuse me, the, the element that's at the front. What's the element at the front's type? It's the dereference of the forward iterator value, right? Because, because it's, we want the first element. Who knows what the type is actually? Yins. No, actually, I think it's an integer and not size t, but it just so happens that the author of this amazing library is sitting up here in the front, Joel. Does, um, does size return int or a, a size t? Oh, um, it does, so I, that's actually correct. It, it returns an MPL int, which is convertible to an int, which is why it's an int and not a size t. Um, okay, so compile time things are going to return things, are they going to return um, values? They're going to return types, right? Because we deal with types. And so at the compiler, when we're dealing with compile time, begin is going to return the type of the iterator if we had at runtime called begin s. So for all of you cool kids 
who are on C++ 11 compilers, you probably mostly don't care ever for, for a large amount of this stuff because you just use the word auto. But for those of us that occasionally still have to you know, live in the stone ages, we need to know what the type is of this thing that we're getting back. And this is how to do it because the type is going to change depend upon all kinds of things, right? These are, these are heterogeneous containers. I don't, I don't ever know what the type is of anything. I actually have to ask, what is, what's the type of this thing? Same with size. So size, we're going to get an MPL int back. Um, empty, we're going to get an MPL true or false back. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's coming up. We'll, we'll get into that more. And then front, um, front, we're going to go ahead and get um, the type that the front would return. So if the <coughs> container contained an int, it would return the int. Um, here we can do assignment if the container is not const, right? So if it's a if it's a non-mutable, sorry, if it's a mutable container, we can we will get a reference back and we can actually make assignments. Mm. Into it. Um, all right, so let's let's now breeze through those. The first one takes a while. After that, they're all the same. Adding to forward sequence, um, bidirectional add to forward sequence, the begin and the end. Um, we're going to get bidirectional iterators back. And um, back is going to return the last element in the sequence. Looks a lot like your standard typical library, right? Random access, begin and end. And then we have, um, I'm, I'm going to try to use a notation here where n represents actually an integer number. And M represents a MPL int. So when you see this, it's a type. So here, this is saying at underscore C, and there's a lot of underscore C things in, in MPL and also in Fusion. Underscore C means you can put like a real integer number in there, which just gets converted to a type eventually. It gets converted to an MPL int type. So it's like a shortcut for those of us who like to count. Um, so at's going to return just like at of a vector. It's going to return what is the, the element that is at that location inside the container. All right. We also have associative sequences in, in um, Fusion. So what is a map in STL? What does a map contain? Okay, pair of key and value. So that you can go ahead and put the key there and you can get the value back, right? What, will be, what, what is a set then? Sets contain just the values. That is a key. Absolutely. The value is the key. We have the same concepts in Fusion. So we have um, has key, at key, so we can test if we have a key and we can check where the key is, or excuse me, we can check what is the element that's at that key location. And the key, because we're talking about fusion, which is half compile time, half runtime, the keys are types. You put a type in and you get a value back out. You put a compile time thing in and you get a runtime thing out. And based upon being able to put compile time things in and getting runtime things out, this is going to be a really powerful thing that we're going to use um, here in a bit to, to build up, hopefully, your imagination of how you can solve amazing problems. Um, so at compile time, we have one additional thing, which is this value at key. At key is going to tell me the type that got returned from at key. If it's a non-mutable Excuse me, if it's a mutable container and my at key would have returned an int, I'm going to get uh, what's in that container spot is an int. I would have gotten the int as a reference so that I can, I can mutate it. But if I really want to know what is the value that's in there, the value type itself, not what I'm going to get back, I ask value at key. And you'll see this pattern is going to pop up a lot. Value at. 
OK. There are all kinds of things we can do with containers, just like, or with, excuse me, with sequences. Just like there are all kinds of things that you can do in the standard template library. You can probably look at this list and know what they're going to do, right? Begin, in, empty, front, back, size. The ones that we were all looking at, so here's an additional one, swap. Here's the value at, value at key. So far, so good. We've got to get through this part so we can actually do something fun. Um, OK, so what do they do? The, um, the intrinsics at runtime, they do this. Begin's going to get the iterator to the first element. End is going to get the iterator one past the element, and so forth. Um, swap is going to call swap for each element between S1 and S2. You pass two sequences in, and it will call swap on, on, on each of them throughout. Um, compile time. In general, when you see things like this, they're going to return whatever the type was at runtime. So the type from the runtime at key is what the type is going to be returned here. Check and see if there are value ones also. If you really want to know what the value was of the thing that was inside of the container or inside of the sequence, um, do that. All right, iterators. So we can dereference an iterator. We can ask for the next. We can ask for the prior. We can compare them. We can get the distance between two iterators. We can advance our iterator, the MPL version, right? So we're going to advance it by giving it an MPL int. We can advance it by giving it just an integer. We can dereference um, for the data. So we have compile time versions of all of these. Next, prior, are these runtime or compile time activities. If you have a tuple and you have an iterator into the tuple and you ask for the next, when does that happen? <coughs> yeah, it has to happen it has to happen at compile time. Because you have this heterogeneous container and, and types exist in compile world, they don't exist in runtime world, not really. The only thing that you can get for next in order to know what type it is, how to get it out, everything you need to know about it is the fact that it happens at compile time. That same recursion that we did in that first slide, and you probably did a lot of in the fun with tuples talk, it's, it's happening for you, or something like it is happening for you behind the scene. And so you get to deal with the library. Fusion deals with it in a mental model that we already have with these, with these containers. Um, you can dereference them using the star operator, and you can also um, compare for naughty. All right, so we've been talking about sequences. There are lots of things that can, or there's two main classifications of things that can be sequences, and one of them is container. Um, so just briefly, we're going to look at containers. We have, um, just like in the standard template library, we have a series of container types. They have different performances. They have different characteristics. You, you pick them um, based upon what? How do you know to pick a vector versus a list, or a list versus a vector from the standard template library? Anybody? Memory utilization, performance. OK, memory utilization, performance. You, you have the same types of mental things you have to go through every time you pick a container, or you should. <laughs> same thing with Fusion. There are different constraints and performance um, values or characteristics to each of the containers. But they're not, they're not what you normally think. So runtime is an interesting thing, but compile time is also an interesting thing. How many of you compiled a large spirit grammar before? How many of you got to get a cup of coffee or two between the time you hit go and the time it stopped? Yeah. <laughs> um, compilers aren't necessarily really good at the way we abuse them, right? They're, we abuse the compiler a lot. It runs really slow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Joel says he's trying his best. <laughs> so um, part of the constraint or part of the characteristic of a container, of a fusion container, is its compile time. Because 
even though we string a bunch of things together, um, there's this really neat thing that the compiler is going to collapse it together and we're going to end up with um, what ends up being like an 01 performance for something that looked like it should have iterated so through a bunch of stuff. So like vector, you want to go and iterate through a vector to the, you know, the nth location. How long is that going to take? O n. How long is it going to take with a fusion vector? Well, let me rephrase that. How long is it going to take with a fusion list? O one. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So there are other things you're going to want to look at when you look at them. So we have random access sequence, it's called a vector. We have cons, how many of you like Lisp? Two people are going to love cons, three. Three people are going to like cons, no one else should use it. Unless you're building a new container. Um, list is made out of cons. List is for the friendly people. Cons is like recursive stuff, right? Lists look linear. Um, there's a deck. Deck has incredibly good performance if you were adding things to the front or back at compile time. Really, really fast at compile time. Vector, horrible if you're adding things to the front or back at compile time. Um, set um, is an associative sequence and map is an associative sequence. Map, of course, is a value, a, um, excuse me, a type to a value. Set, the key or the value and the type are the same thing. So you shove an int in and when you ask for an int back, it's that one. We'll look at some of these. Things you can do, you can make lists, you can make cons, you can make vector. Just like you can make pair. How many of you use make pair? See, familiar stuff, right? So um, you can do all the same things here. So how would we maybe make a list? Well, make list, and we go ahead and give it some value. And now we have a list. So we got our fusion list. We can do something with it. It's like make tuple, right? But I get to tell it what type of container type I want. I can. Um, make a list this way and use a ref if I actually wanted a reference to the value as opposed to copy by value. So value semantics, no, I really actually wanted a ref to I. Um, you can make a cons if you want, if you really need that recursive stuff in lots and lots of parentheses. So cons has a value and a tail, right? And eventually this one has no tail, so it terminates. I can make a set. So this set is going to have um, a sequence of two values in it. Um, it's an associative set. The first one is going to be of a type int. So I, if I ask for an int, I'm going to get 42 back. A bool. If I ask for a bool, I'm going to get true back. We can make maps. So maps are types versus values. So a uint8, if I ask for a uint8, I'm going to get C++ now out. If I ask for a bool, I'm going to get 42. And if I ask for a standard string, I'm going to get true. If I did them in order, you guys would be like, yeah, that makes sense. If this just looks like an associative um, a set instead. So make map. Make sense? Okay, we can make some ties. So we have a struct amazing conference, amazing number, and a valid key. Um, let's go ahead and create a string and a value um, and a bool. I'm going to map tie. These are the keys, right? Map tie, comp, value, valid. This is going to create a sequence, in this case an associative sequence, of references to my initial values. Just like a tie normally does. But this tie now I can say at key valid key giving it my sequence equals true. This is going to set true to the bool valid. So it gave it a type get my value back out, and now I can muck with it. What's my value? Well, my value is a reference to valid. Why is it a reference to valid? Because valid is the third argument here, and my third key is valid key. 
All right. There's all kinds of meta function stuff too on the other side. Um, functions for converting containers. If you have a container or you have a sequence, you can actually say, that's nice, but I really would like it if it was this other type instead. You have a list. And, um, or in this case, we have a vector. I have a vector. Please take my vector and give it to me as a list. So it will convert vector into a list type. And now I have a list that I'm dealing with. We'll play with this a little bit later. We'll see why we might want to do this. Um, so as set. Here I have a vector, 42 and false. I tell it to make it as set. Well, what, how's it going to do this? Because a set is an associative thing. Pick the types of each of the elements. Yeah, pick, just pick up the types of each of the elements, because that's what it should do, right? Pick up the types of each of the elements. Because if it didn't pick up the type of each of the element, it would be a map instead. So let's do one of those. As map. We're going to make a vector of pairs. So we're going to make pairs where the pair is a fusion pair. Fusion pairs, because everything in fusion is half compile time and half runtime. The pair is compile time type string, runtime type, or runtime value 42. Make another pair, uint8 versus fish. I have a vector of these, and now I can make that as a map, where then the types are going to be the keys, and then the values will be actually the, the values inside of my, um, my sequence. Okay, and there are meta versions for that, too. Um, okay, so there are all kinds of things that are already adapted to look like fusion sequences. They just work. They just work by including the right include file. Um, You'll know that you didn't include the right food file because you'll see like this mess of compiler puke on your screen. You know, hey, I didn't include the right include file. Normally, if you have been doing any spirit, it'll be this one that most people seem to forget to include adapted standard pair. So we can take arrays, just like C style arrays. Um, pairs, MPL sequences, boost array, boost tuple, standard tuple, those adapt simply by including the appropriate include header. You include it and then you just work. Yes? So uh, how, much, how much dependency of the rest of the boost is within the core view? The question is, is how much um, dependency is on the rest of boost without, um, within Fusion without itself? The without the adapt. Without the adapt. My understanding is um, the core is just on MPL is the only dependency. Is that correct? Yes. MPL is the only dependency. Um, these we'll talk about a little bit later, though you've already seen some of that, right? How do we adapt a structure, structure or how do we d adapt some arbitrary data type? Well, we, as we adapt them by using those macros. And what those macros basically do is they create all the correct scaffolding and infrastructure in the background so you don't have to see it that will allow it to look like a sequence anytime we need a sequence. All right, views. So views are very cool. What happens if you take two STD tuples, and you combine them together. What do you get out? Did you, did you guys just do this in the fun with tuples? Did you take tuples and cat them together, tuple, tuple cat? You get another tuple. Uh, you get a real tuple, right? A whole nother tuple out. That could be expensive depending upon what you're doing. If you're catting these things all day long and you're trying to build up large structures, it may not be what you want. What you might want is something that's really lazy just a view. You may want what looked like a view, or lo looked like a new tuple, but was nothing more than a view of the two tuples stuck together, and behaved in every way just like the, the two stuck together. That's what a view is. So let's pretend I created a view of this container in which I filtered it so that I only wanted the types that were ints. Please give me what looks like a new sequence. It's a view. And when I, when I use it, I just want to see the ints. Well, what happens is it's very lightweight. It's nothing more than references into the actual real container. All right, so here, 
Let's go ahead and make a vector. C++ now. 2013. Awesome, of course. And true inside of a deck. So we have two types. We have a vector and a deck. And now I'm going to say join them. And now I have a view. That view will appear to now, when I use it, I can use it like any other sequences. It has all of those same characteristics that a sequence had. We'll look at what, what those types are. Um, and I can use it anywhere that I'd use a sequence. And it'll do the right thing. It's very lightweight. So there are still two containers. Let's say, though, let's say that these are going to go out of scope. Bad news, right? You want to return something. I really want, to, at some point I've done some work, and now I want to take, let's say, this one, uh, which is the only the ints that were inside of my container, and I want to return that somewhere. How would I do that if, with a view? Because I'm going to lose my references, so that's bad, right? Can't do that. As vector. as vector. I simply take and call as vector on my view, which behaves as a sequence. And what I get out now is a vector that is a copy, a real vector, of what that view was. OK, so we have a single view, a filter view, iterator view. Joint view, zip view, transform view, reverse view, in view, repetitive view. And they have, they model these sequence types. So a single view randoms, um, models a random access sequence. A single view is actually just like it sounds like. It is a view that looks like a sequence that points to only one element, a single element view. Filter view, um, do I have, no. Filter view, um, you can filter it. I just want to know the ints. Um, joint view, we just saw that. Zip view, we used a little while ago, right? That's how we, that's how we got um, our Pythagoras to work. Transform view, make it look like something else. Reverse view, um, let's do it the opposite way. In view, this is kind of cool. You can give it a vector of integers that are how you would like to access it. So, you know, I really, I have this container, and I'd really like to access the container the third element, the seventh element, and then the fourth element. And so now when I iterate over it, that's how it iterates. And then repetitive view. How many times would you like to see the same thing over and over again? OK. Um, the reason for the multiple models on the right is because it depends on the underlying container. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So the question is, is the assumption is that the, the multiple models on the right is because it depends on the container. Good, good um, observation. So MPL, um, MPL will give you back the same container type that you originally had. Um, in Fusion, you may not get back the same container type that you originally had. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Um, the view you're going to get back, though, is dependent upon the container that you're taking views of. What are you going to do for like a view of a random access and um, or, sorry, a joint of a forward and a joint of a of a um, the deck. So we had the vector and the deck. Um, when we take the view of that, what are we going to get? Yeah, the least. That's right, the least. Um, and so we might get um, something back that's different than than what we might have thought originally. Um, okay. So views are very very lightweight. Um, you can, you can compose them over and over again. You can keep cascading views of views and using this view to make another view and transforming that view then to make another view and then filtering the view to be something else. And at the end, you've copied no data around at all. They're just views into existing data. So they're, they're extremely lightweight mechanisms. Um, so let's look at a couple of the algorithms. Um, algorithms, first of all, are lazy. They are not sequence type preserving. That's the whole, you put something in, you might have gotten something else out. The sequence was of type um, random access. Maybe you got a forward sequence out. And um, they return views. So as opposed to returning heavier weight items, they return views. There are four main types auxiliary, iteration, query, and transformation. We're not going to go through all of them. I'm going to give you an idea of what they look like. Because when you look at this, they're going to they're look 
like you probably know what they might do. Copy, you probably can figure out what copy is going to do, right? It's going to copy one sequence into another sequence. Um, iteration type stuff, for each. We used for each a little while ago. Fold, we used that a little while ago. Queries, you can ask questions about your container. Now, when you ask questions about your container, what do you think you're asking? <coughs> yeah, you're asking static information. Do any of the things in this container contain an int? Or are an int, excuse me? Or are of type foo? Or all of them of type foo? Maybe none of them. None of them are type foo. Find if, or find the foo. Find if, this will return the iterator to the first whatever MPL lambda expression. Can we use the word expression with a lambda in MPL? How would you say that? <laughs> MPL lambda thing. <laughs> count how many there are, count how many there are if some predicate is true. There are all kinds of transformations. We can filter, we can filter if things. Replace, remove. Um, remove, this is cool. How about the remove if? I have a sequence, a fusion, let's say a fusion deck of stuff. And I say, um, remove if it's an int, because I don't want any ints. What do I get back? I get a view back that is a sequence of all the things that weren't ints. So it's very lightweight. I, again, all of these things are returning views, and I can compose them and just use them again. Because what they take is they take sequences, and a view is a sequence. Push back, push front. Again, push back and push front. How, could, how in the world could you mutate these things? Well, you mutate them because they're not being mutated, right? You're getting views back. All right. There's some functional stuff, too. Um, so we'll just we'll introduce the words, and then we'll pretty much be done here. So foo takes three arguments, um, an int, a standard string, and a double. If I was to have a fused version of foo, it would take one argument. It would take the tuple or the container or the sequence that would expand to these. In fusion, you end up with a polymorphic function, which means that it isn't necessarily just an int, a string, and a double, but it could be anything that will satisfy that. So this is the fused version of, fu of foo, and this would be the unfused version. What, what does this look like, you think? How, how did I get from this to this? Possibly a map? Uh, kind, of, kind of as a functor looking thing, maybe, right? I mean, who, do you care? Exactly. <laughs> you don't care. You just use the fusion library and you're happy. <laughs> All right, so let's fuse some things here. Let's take um, foo, which takes two doubles. And I have um, an array that has a one, a three, and a five in it. And then I have a fusion vector with an int, a float, and a double. And I'm going to call transform of the zip of these two things. So zip is going to give me then the one and the 42 first, and then the three and the, and they're going, I'm going to get those as um, a fusion sequence, right? I'm going to get those as a tuple. Think of it as I have a tuple with two things in it. Well, now I have a tuple with two things in it, and I'm calling into foo that takes double double. That's not going to work out real well. So what do I do? I just say, make fused. Make foo fused. And now, foo, the result of this, which is a functor, will take the fusion sequence and then expand it out and apply it to foo. Does that make sense? All right. Um, there's this thing called invoke. Invoke basically does the same thing, but without creating this fused type that we can then use. So we have foo that takes a double and an int. I have a fusion vector. It's got the two, two values in it. And I can invoke foo with v. And that will expand out the parameters to foo. 
All right, those are the basic tools. What can you build with the basic tools of STL? Amazing stuff, right? You guys are all falling asleep. Somebody open up windows. <laughs> all right, so let's do some amazing stuff. This is not so amazing. We're going to start with not so amazing, and, and we'll see how we do on time, and we'll, we'll end up maybe with something else. Um, okay. So we're going to serialize something. Um, there's lots of ways to serialize things, right? But we, we now know, thanks to uh, that first little, little thing that we saw in calculating distances, <coughs> that we could serialize any data structure we have if we adapted it to be a fusion sequence. Isn't that cool? How many people already do this type of thing? The smart guy in the back over there does. We had this discussion last night at dinner. All right, so what does my serialized function look like? My serialized function takes a templated parameter, T, V. So I've got V. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to call fusion for each, giving it V. And um, what's going to happen? Well, serial out. I'm going to give it this functor to be applied for each of the elements that are within V. What does serial out look like? Well, my serial out at the moment looks like this. So it's a functor, takes type T, whatever it is, and it goes ahead and creates a serialized type based upon the T, calls right on it, passing it whatever the element was. So if I had a tuple that had an int, an std string, and a float, so this is first getting called with an int. It's getting specialized on an int. The int's getting passed into the right, then the string, then the float. Make sense so far? All right, so what does simple look like? Or I should say serialized. We've got the one at the top that does absolutely nothing. So if I haven't specialized it, it, it won't work. Then I have. Um, I'm sorry about the formatting, but there's only so much room on the board. Here's a serialized that's been specialized on int32. Um, and we have a really amazing serializa serialization mechanism of C outing, you know, everything we get. It's very cool. Um, this one has been specialized on uint32. This one on std string. So we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to actually find out what its size is, put its size out, and then actually put the string representation out. So I can now serialize um, things that have an int32, a uint32, and an std string. Beyond that, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of lost at the moment. But that's really not the interesting part. You can specialize however you want. What I can't do, though, because of the way I called serialize, um, this type is expecting something. Excuse me, this type is expecting something. And so let's, let's fix this a little bit. Let's change it so that now um, I have my operator such that if it is not a sequence, so the thing that I have, the type that I have is not a sequence type, then just call the serialize, serialize write on that type. So if I have an int, just call write. But if the thing that I have is a sequence, oh, I have a foo that contained a bar. Oh, well, that's cool, because bar hopefully has already been adapted to a fusion sequence. Then in that case, just call serialize on it. And then we'll descend inside of bar. Well, what if I have a vector of bars? OK, well, let's write out the size of the vector. And then for each, oh, look, an std for each, because it's a runtime vector thing, std. Begin and end and then this. And so we're going to go ahead and call the serialization again. So with this modification um, to serial out, I can now handle things that are fusion sequences or not fusion sequences and nested fusion sequences or vectors of type. And you can see pretty quickly how 
you can write not too much code and you would be able to serialize um, any type that contains another type and so forth simply by making sure that you have adapted your types to, to be a fusion sequence. And those types could be easy structs or they can be some type that have setters and getters, right? Let's go through. Um, let's go through another example here. All right. So I have um, this vector. We've seen this already. This idea, right? A vector of, of um, here an int, and a, a string, literal. And I'm going to invoke do something, giving it the vector, and that's going to expand out. Let's go ahead and um, adapt our foo. So foo contains a string, an int, actually two of them, and a double. And notice what I did with the adapt. When you adapt something to a sequence, a fusion sequence, you don't have to adapt all of it, and you don't have to adapt it in the same order. It doesn't matter. You adapt it however you want. In fact, if you want to re repeat the same item multiple times, go ahead. So I've adapted foo with i and then s. So if I was to iterate through these, I'd first see the i and then I'd see the s. I'm going to give it, I'm going to create a foo with CPP now, 42.8, 134.5, and then I can invoke it. Yes? No, so an adaption is, the question is, is when you adapt the struct, do you lose the other members, or is it a copy? An adaption looks a lot like a tie, those ties that we looked at earlier. It's looking into the struct. And so it is a sequence that is like a view into your struct. How much of a view do I want into this struct? Well, I want a view that only gets me I and S. I don't care about anything else. Now, you might want to have, like, multiple different types of views of the same struct, depending upon what you're doing. You could do that, and um, you would use a slightly different adaption mechanism than this one. There are, the, the docs are really good um, as a reference, and now you know to go and look for adapt. And you can see how to adapt things into your own namespace, give them their own unique ways. At the moment, you haven't seen any other magic because it's all being handled by Fusion. It adapts it and it puts all the magic inside of a namespace that it can find again later. But if you want to adapt it into a namespace that you can find again later and do things with, you can do that too. For example, let's say you had a, this struct and sometimes I want actually the string in J, but the other times I want all of it because I'm serializing it out. Not a problem. You just treat it as two different adaptions. All right, let's go ahead and create um, a very pretend example here. It's only partially pretend because I've been working on something like this, but it's completely pretend because it's nothing like what I did. So this is going to be the simple version, I hope. Um, we're going to have this box make a call, uh, like an RPC call. And in order to do that, it has to serialize its call and then some magic occurs that we don't care about. But on the other side, the call is going to show up and the implementer of the call is going to do something amazing. Um, and it's going to implement some interface. Make sense? So some RPC interface it's implementing. This is the interface. It's going to start and stop, set power, get power. Okay, so let's think about ways that we can maybe deal with this. When we serialize and send the thing across, we might as well serialize and send it across as some type, some, some data type. And so we're going to create this namespace called method, and we're going to have some structs in here to represent our calls. Stop, start, set power, that actually had an argument, right? Get power. It returned a type, but it doesn't have an argument. And then we're going to adapt them. OK so far? All right. 
And now I'm going to create this thing called foo interface. So foo interface is going to be a map. And when I construct the map, I have to give it the pair of what I want, type versus what will eventually be a value. I can put the type in, I can get a value back out. So my types are the types of my calls. And my values are going to be STD functions that represent the call signature of the call, which were void nullaries for, for the first two. This one takes an int, and this one returns an int. So far, so good. OK. And then I'm just going to type def that to call map t. Um, how am I going to use it? Well, here I have this thing called foo provider. It's going to inherit from RPC base, and it's going to pass the interface in. I wrote virtual up there just so you guys could all throw things at me. But you'll see why we did it here in a moment. Does it have to be virtual? No. So I have a bunch of virtual things here. It's going to represent the provider interface. What is inside of this RPC base? Well, there are two methods, tie and make call. And it's going to extract the call map type out of the interface, and it's going to make a call map. Tie is going to allow me to tie one of the methods based upon its type to some function that I want called when that type is seen. And how does it do that? Well, that's easy. It just says at key, what is the key? The key is the method type. I give it the map, and I assign that to the function value. So remember, I have this map. The keys are types, and the values are what? Yeah, std functions that represent, hopefully, then the functions that I'll call when I see that type. All right. The magic box, that magic thing, is going to somehow call make call when it sees types. And it's going to call make call, um, passing it this method, this templated method, which is the type that we have. So this is a mess, and we'll make it cleaner later. We want to know what the function type is that's being stored at the location for method. So I have this map of methods versus function types. Well, how do I get that out? Well, I use result of value at key, the map type, and then the key. And I ask for its type. And now function t is a type def to the type that's going to be contained at that location inside of the map. This is for all you, all you poor people who don't have C++11 compilers. So now I can say function t method equals at key method call map. For the method type, get what the function is that's going to need to be called. Did I get one? If so, invoke it with the thing that was passed in. Because the thing that's passed in is a sequence that contains the arguments, if there were any. So just invoke the method, right? OK. So um, more ugliness. Here's a foo provider that we had before. And, and in its constructor, it's going to actually call tie of the method stop to its stop and start to its start and set power to its power and get power to its get power. So it's, it's hooking itself up. Completely ugly. So let's make it better. Um, oh, well, let's first show you how. So then if we had a foo, um, foo can then inherit from foo provider and then provide whatever its implementation is of the, of the interface. Um, GORP can inherit from it and supply its, its version of the interface. So if we had a type coming in, we could then map that to what we want to call. Um, the user would just create foos, and that box infrastructure would somehow call make call, passing it in. For example, set power, and then f's 
set power method is going to get called with the right with the right bits with the invoke. All right, let's make it a little bit better. Um, so you probably saw how that worked, but it looked ugly from a user's point of view. And there's a lot we could do to make this better, but not in the amount of time we have remaining. So let's just look at one thing that we can do to help our interfaces become a little prettier, nicer to use. Um, so here we had this thing with methods that were described as structs. And then when we did the mapping, we put the signatures far away from where the methods were. And that was kind of ugly. So first off, uh, this isn't going to work real well. This is a maintenance headache. So let's just do something um, not quite as ugly <laughs> and put in these type defs inside of our structs. So now stop, while it doesn't contain any members, it does contain this type def that tells me what the signature is for the stop call. What's the signature of the start call? Oh, get power finally has something useful in which we now know that returns an int. Now what does our foo interface description look like? Our interface description now looks like an MPL vector. An MPL vector. Back to the last slide. Um, what's with the hint percent and set power? Um, set power takes one argument. But, so, but, the hint, you put one argument in the book. Oh, okay. We adapted it to a fusion sequence earlier. Right, so when it gets invoked with this thing coming in, when we invoke set power, it will, I have to repeat your question. The question was, what's the deal with the int percent inside of set power? And, it, and this, um, the structs represent not just the methods, but they're going to re represent the data arguments that are going to be in, in the call. And, and they've been adapted. OK. Um, OK, so now my interface is a little easier to, to look at. I can describe an interface as being nothing more than an MPL vector of types. MPL vectors are, are collections or containers. It's a vector of type only information. That's what the, the MPL library deals with, just types only. So this is all going to go away later, but right now I can describe types. It's got these types. Those types represent my interface. Or another way of saying it, these methods represent this interface. Um, this looks the same, but I call this instead of an, R, an RPC proxy now. So we're going to use it a little bit differently. All this looks basically the same, except this became a little easier now to deal with. Um, that was a joke, but you haven't seen it yet. So call map T represents the same map, the map of the type versus the function that I want to call. How am I going to make one of those? Well, it ends up that I have all the information I need at compile time to make one if I can use the MPL library to extract it out. So a map is what? Well, a map is type versus value. And I need to know what the values are or the types of the values I'm going to shove into this map. So let's go and create them by using an MPL transform. What I'm going to transform? I'm going to transform my interface. What was my interface? It was the types. It's going to make a pair out of the placeholder is the first item, which is the type. So for example, stop, then start, then set power. So make pair, because um, when I have my pairs for my, my MPL map, they need to be type versus value. Um, and then some magic here to get the call signature out of the type. And once I have this transform, I'm going to call it my call map definition type. And now, remember, one of the things we can do is we can, we can make compatible, I'm sorry, we can make um, fusion sequences out of MPL sequences. So I have a fusion sequence when I get done with this that's going to represent pairs of types. And I'm going to say, take that MPL sequence and convert it into a fusion sequence by saying as map. So take that, take this, and make it um, into a map. Now I have my call map type. And this will happen at compile time. Call sig does nothing more than takes the type looks inside and gets the call sig, sets that to type, um, and that's the canonical way to, to deal with MPL stuff. Um, 
Okay. Users don't deal with this though, right? Libraries can look ugly as long as the user interface looks great. So now my RPC proxy looks a little bit different, or excuse me, my make call looks a little bit different. Um, I am now using a C++11 compiler, so I can use the word auto, and I don't need all of that other decoration. And I can just say at key method of the call map, get the method out. Do I, have, do I really have one to call? If so, go ahead and invoke the method with the arguments. Bam, it gets called. How do I implement them? Hmm, the same as before. So I've got a GORP, G, and somewhere in that magic box, G make call gets called with start, and the right method gets called on it. So far makes sense? All right. I, I could do another thing too, though, if I wanted. Um, I could say, I have this RPC proxy that was our type that we were inheriting from earlier. And in, it's going to implement the foo interface. And now I have a foo proxy. And I can just say foo proxy tie this method to this free function. And now when the magic happens in the back, the right thing occurs. So the interface is starting to look a little bit nicer. It has a lot of, a lot of room to grow. Though. All right, let's look at another example. Um, all right, so what I want to do here is I, I want to signal things when activities occur. And I want to signal them based upon um, groups. So I have, um, I have these groups, one, two, three. And um, I want to be able to call notify group two. And everything that's associated with group two gets called. Or when I notify signal A, everything that's also part of group, um, every, the group that signal A belongs to, the whole group gets sig um, signaled. So my signals are going to be A, B, C, D, E. And then I'm going to create some groups. Uh, group one is going to consist of A and C. And group two is B and D. And I have a group three that's just D. So at this slide, when I signal A, A and C should be signaled because they belong to the same group. Um, OK, so I have this signal combiner that takes the group. What was the group? Um, well, it takes the groups, plural, multiple groups. All the groups that the signal handler is going to deal with. And we can, um, we can add listeners to it. And we can, uh, we'll, we can do some other things that aren't in the slide yet. Hmm. OK, so we can add listeners to it, which is simply going to take and um, add, based upon the signal, my function that wants to be notified. So I have some map in here, the signal map. And the signal map is going to be created by, oh, this is what you were, this is what we need here. Sorry, the signal combiner <laughs> is instantiated with all the groups that it's going to deal with. So these are the groups. I somehow need to flatten these groups out because what I really want is a flat map. I just want a map of all the types versus then all of the people who want to know about that type being signaled. So I'm going to flatten it out, and I'm not going to show that code. And then we're going to make a pair based upon the type, and then um, just some std func that's a void and off the screen. And now I have my signal map. So I have a map based upon all the signals that, that were contained in any of the groups. The groups all got flattened out. And so I have an A and a C and a B and a D and an E. And um, those are the keys. And then I have some set of values. Um, OK, and so that's my map. A adding a listener is as simple as then adding it in based upon the signal. Notifying the group 
So I can notify a group, notify group C, or group one, excuse me, notify group one that um, we're going to go ahead and um, signal everybody in group one. I'm going to do an MPL for each. MPL for each, remember groups are what? They're a vector of types. So a group was nothing more than a vector of some types. It's going to, for each type that's inside of that group, It's going to go ahead and use this as a, um, as a functor. So it's going to call this operator. And this operator is going to do nothing more than take the signal that it gets, which is the type, look it up out of the map, get the, the function that wants to be called, and then go ahead and call that function. Yes? What happens when you were flattening the map? What happens if you had the same uh, signal in more than one group? That's a good question. So the question is, is what happens if the same signal was in more than one group? Um, the, the answer is when you flatten it, it shows up more than one time. And in the fusion sequence itself, or the fusion map, the associative map, when you build it, um, it's going to be there more than once, which is surprising the first time it happens to you. Um, because you think of maps as having only one of those keys. Um, so it's, it's partially up to you to, to make sure that you don't insert more than one. The um, compile time overhead of checking to make sure is, is horrendous. Um, so um, the other half of the problem is, is if that same is in, in multiple groups, so if E was in groups one and two, can we notify both one and two? Is there another way to do it, right, uh, on the notification side? So from a, a map point of view, what happens is if you put in an int and there were two ints inside of it, you're going to get the first one back up. Slightly surprising. Um, so on, so this handles groups. Easy to do. We can just iterate all the group, all, all the items inside the group, all the, all the unique um, elements inside the group, and notify each one of them. But if I notify a signal, what I really want to do is I want to say, what are the groups that that signal belongs to? So I can notify everyone in the group. And so I can do that um, with find if. And Ro as Rob pointed out, this could fail if the signal belongs to multiple groups you would solve this instead of using find if, because this fits on one slide, with a filter instead. And then you could get all of them out, that, um, all the groups out, and, and use it that way. So find if, I'm giving it groups, these are all the groups I have. If it contains whatever my signal type is, that's gonna create a new type, um, an iterator to it. I can now take that iterator, dereference it, because this is the group itself that contained the type. Um, and then I can notify the group and everything's notified. Yes? The question is, is at runtime, can, can something unsubscribe? from being in a group. And with this scheme, no, because these are built at compile time. Um, yes? Uh, in your uh, find if, signal doesn't appear, so how are you finding it in the groups? Um, MPL1, oh, is the group value? It's off the side. That's a great question. The question is, is how can you find the signal in the group if there's no signal? So <laughs> groups is the collection of all groups. So it's a collection of MPL vectors. When I look through those, what I'm looking through then is I'm looking through an MPL vector one at a time, all the MPL vectors. And then the placeholder then is the vector that I'm looking at. 
And what's off the screen and you can't see over here is the signal that came in. And if the signal is contained inside of that group, it will result in true, and find if will then um, result in um, an iterator for the group. Thank you. Any other mistakes on the slide? Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, what happens if it's not found? So you would hope that if it's not found, you will end up with some compiler error that makes sense. Because all of this is happening at compile time. It's unlikely that will happen. <laughs> we'll probably end up with a bunch of spew that at some point you'll go, type such and such is not in MPL vector or whatever, or it's in there. Yeah. So it's static assert compared to n. That would have been nice. So the, the um, Joel's suggesting that if there was a static assert to compare it to n before actually dereferencing it, we would be OK, um, which is indeed true. All right. So. Um, you, you've got just unfortunately a small taste of a little bit of fusion a and fusion is like very scary powerful um, so I'm going to try here and I'm going to fail miserably but let's name some of the libraries that utilize fusion under the hood proto um, spirit phoenix um, MSM. Um, anybody else? Guys, no? You can help me out. All right, we'll just start with those. If you start looking, a lot of the crazy, weird boost libraries that do amazing things and have these great user interfaces. How many of you have used MSM to build state machines? It's got this beautiful interface for describing what. Um, the state table looks like. It's just gorgeous. Things like that, those, those interfaces, come about by being able to describe both compile time things, things that are happening at compile time, and cool runtime activity in the background. And Fusion ends up being the enabler for that for you. We saw, unfortunately, maybe some pretty poor examples here, <laughs> but would hopefully get you thinking a little bit about the fact that if you had an STL-like library, that worked on top of tuples, what could you do with it? Right, so I think for a lot of people, tuples are not maybe necessarily used a whole lot. Now that they're in the standard, they're probably gonna be getting used a lot more. But they have weak support. They're like this heterogeneous container, and that's about it. But if you had all these algorithms and iterators and things that you can do with them, then you can suddenly make very rich um, interfaces at compile time that do neat things at runtime. Um, wh why do you want to make, so maybe this is not clear, what's part of the advantage of making cool things at compile time? Yeah. He, one is you don't have to do as much at runtime. The whole O1 versus ON, right? Fail early, compile time checking. If you have a system that's basically more or less static or appears to be morphing around a bit, I mean, we just, we just showed an example with signals in which um, sometimes the runtime or the compile time build of something, you know a lot of the behavior that has to exist in it, but you want it configurable at compile time in an easy way, in a way in which you can make some small modifications to um, the input into the library, then you get the speed, you get compile time fail early, you get a lot of things that you don't get if you would use a runtime library. They're, they're all really fast, actually. I'll, just, I'll stick them up on GitHub later today, if you want. Yeah, they, they're all really small things <coughs> at the moment, and um, Fusion is, is actually fast, fast compile. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. So the comment was um, lots of beautiful, wonderful, nice things about fusion. <laughs> and that um, the way that Edward likes to sell it is that it is like compile time introspection. Is that right? Did I repeat that correctly? Okay. Yeah, um, and, and so we saw some of the introspection. The serialization example is a perfect one. You could do some pretty amazing things if you had introspection, right? And um, you, you basically do by using Fusion. So I, I just feel like it kind of describes the serialization, but we do basically the very similar thing. But we use Fusion um, for our work code base for sending around active messages, for basically for serializing um, STD function and put it on that. It's all built around Fusion um, for the arguments. And for things like going through the, all the arguments and you know, figuring out all the arguments, serialize both. Is, it, is this for HPX? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Bryce's comment is, is for HPX, which is um, LSU's high performance computing platform, that they use Fusion also for serialization and serialization of calls um, and for checking. All right, we are just about out of time, which is perfect because I'm just about out of slides. No, nope, I'm out of slides. Um, thank you for your time, and um, if you have any questions, let me know. Nope. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The question. Okay, so the question is: Is can a tuple be used, for example, for a time series, um, or for very large containers worth of information? The answer is um, not really. <laughs> your compiler will eventually die on you. So there are, there are two problems. First of all, Fusion as it is out of the box when you just start using it, it will have a limit of 10 or 20? 10 or 20 elements, I don't remember what the number is. Is it? Well, if you add the pound to find. Oh, for the vector it's 50. And for the other element, yeah, so for a vector it's 50. For the other elements, because they are built by, um, by creating either recursion or chains of references to other ones. Yeah, okay, and then for C11, with the variadics, you, you basically can have your tuple until you kill your compiler. So, however large that is. Yeah, yeah, it would be a different use case. I believe so. Um, the last part again, fusion be used for? I believe the question is, is can a fusion sequence be used for database select? Yeah, so um, I, I don't see why not. It will be the, you know, but let, let me let just add to that, right? Um, so. How many went to the Spirit talk? A few of you went to it. Um, you know, Spirit uses all these cool operators in order to create yeah. this domain-specific embedded language so that it's easy to read and look at. And it builds up fusion things in the background to do its work, right? You, you could easily do something like that with SQL or whatever else it is, right? You could create it building these sequences together um, and, and then doing something with them afterwards. I think it's really a, I think it's a good question because when you're when you're querying a database, you're more column oriented. But when you're dealing with the records, you're more row oriented. Mm. So it's you know this transformation is really interesting. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the response was is that it, it was a good question. The the rows versus the columns and how that works out with um, being able to do transforms. Any other questions? Thank you.